Hello, everybody. In most parts of the world, people know the Latin alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. You're looking at it right now. I've used it to spell out the words of the title of this presentation, The Evolution of the Latin Alphabet. Now, most people have no idea where these letters come from. So in this presentation, I'm going to try to explain to you where these letters come from. So the title of my lecture is The Evolution of the Latin Alphabet from Egyptian through Phoenician, Greek, and Etruscan. Now in this conference, we are talking about the Romanization, as we say, of Chinese characters and where that Romanization comes from. And so the question is, when we talk about Egypt and we talk about Italy or Rome, or, or the Latin culture, or we talk about Phoenicians, or anything like that. What does that have to do with China? So we have the Chinese characters, we have Egyptian hieroglyphs, we have the Latin alphabet, and we have the Romanization, which is called, of Chinese, which is called Han Pinyin. And so the question is, how do these four things relate? How are they connected? Our story begins with a goddess and a stone. There's the picture of the goddess right there. You may not be able to identify her yet, but soon you will. And then in the lower part of the screen, you can see the stone. And most people will recognize that as turquoise, and that's exactly what it is, turquoise. Now the goddess is this one right here. Now you can see that this goddess has different forms, but it's all her. We can see that sometimes she is a cow, but when she's a cow, there's always the sun disk right between her horns. You can see it here more clearly. And you can see here where she is in the form of a woman, but on the top of her head, there is the sun disk between her horns. And even when she is strictly in the form of a woman, you can see that she still has the ears of the cow here, here. Now this is her symbol. This is her hieroglyph. It is a box which represents a house or a mansion and inside there is a falcon. Now this falcon or kind of hawk represents the god Horus and we'll be talking about that in a minute but when we're looking at this goddess we're actually seeing a representation of two gods at the same time. Her name is Hathor, which comes from the Greek, Hathor. Now this is, once again, her symbol or her sign, and here's another version. And this is the, um, sort of like the Romanization of ancient Egyptian, and this is Chawat Her, Chawat Her. Chawat Her means the mansion of Horus. Now the stone is turquoise, and turquoise, you could see it here in this very famous mask of Tutankhamun. And so the question is, where did the Egyptians get turquoise? And the answer is pretty simple. The Egyptians got turquoise in Egypt. Uh, they have turquoise in Egypt, and so they got it from there. But in particular, the place they got it from is called, today, Serabit al Khadem, And you can see it right here in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula. Now let's get back to our goddess. Now in addition to being the goddess of music, dance, fertility, and the personification of joy, love, motherhood, she was also the patron goddess of Miners. Now this is a Chinese coal miner, but mining is mining. Digging down in the earth to get resources or to get semi-precious stones like the turquoise. This is very, very dangerous business. Now she is the patron goddess of miners, so it's not surprising that at Serabit there would be a temple dedicated to Hathor. So when the miners went down into the earth, 
they would make offerings to Hathor that they might find turquoise. If they came out finding turquoise or not, they still made offerings to Hathor because they were able to come out of the ground safely. That's not the case for a lot of people. So there's this huge temple complex that had been built and it was occupied for over 800 years, perhaps longer. And this was dedicated to the worship of Hathor because she is the patron goddess of miners in this place where mining for turquoise was going on. Now, not only Egyptians worked in the mines, Canaanites also came to work at Serabit al Khadem. They came down from this area up here near the Dead Sea, Canaan, and they came down to work in Serabit al Khadem. Now, it's important to note that these Canaanites didn't have a writing system of their own. They had a perfectly beautiful language, but they did not have the ability to write that language. Learning to write a language is kind of a late development for a lot of people. In fact, there are still languages today that don't have writing systems. And that was the case. Now, in Sarabit, the Canaanites were surrounded by hieroglyphs. And so we could imagine that at some point, I mean, we can imagine we're human beings, we might do the same thing. At a certain point, they might work, walk over to some of these beautifully carved stones, point to an image in it, and ask, what is this? To an Egyptian, what does this mean? Let's take a look at hieroglyphs. This is a hieroglyph of a very famous king, a very recent king, actually, in relative terms. And each one of these little symbols represent either an idea or a sound. Now, in the case of foreign names, and this is a foreign king, each one of these symbols represents a sound of his name. This is a more famous king, and these symbols also represent sounds within his name. And so this first rectangle here is, has a P sound. T, A, L, M, E, and s. You put this all together, you get Ptalmis, which is actually the Greek name Ptalemaios, or Ptalemi, as we say in English, or in Chinese, you say Tolemi. A L K S E N D R S Alexanders, or Alexander or Alexandros, as we would say in Greek. Or in Chinese, it's Yalishanda. Now, we can imagine <clears throat> a kind of conversation going on between an Egyptian and a Canaanite. Let's say the, the Canaanite came up and saw this symbol there on some monument. What's that? An Egyptian would say, it's a house. Now here's the real step. The Canaanite would say, Oh, bayit. Bayit is Canaanitic for house. So rather than saying the Egyptian word, which is per, the Canaanite said bayit. The Canaanite idea of bayit slowly becomes the Hebrew letter, Bet. The second letter of the Hebrew alphabet is the letter Bet, which means house. The letter can also function as a prefix to a noun meaning within. Here is a common Hebrew term using the word Bet. Bet Israel, the house of Israel, referring to the collective population of all those who claim to be Jewish or identify themselves with Israel. So you can see that the letter bet is directly derived from the Egyptian symbol for house, per. Now, from this, what happened, and this is a rather complicated story, but uh, I'll give you some references so you can read into it yourself, but this is what we call the proto sinitic alphabet, and this is an idealized alphabet that was developed. So basically what happened is those Canaanitic people they looked at these Egyptian symbols and they took from them what they needed to represent the sounds of their language. And so, for example, the first one is Aleph, and it's an ox's head. In Phoenician, or Canaanitic, the word Aleph literally means an ox. 
but we'll see later what this becomes. It will eventually become a letter that we see every single day. Now this all occurred somewhere between 1850 BC and 1550 BC. We're not very sure. People argue quite a lot about when this occurred. There's a kind of 300 year window there where we're not sure, but suffice it to say, this is a long, long time ago, and this is the proto syndetic script. Now, there was an archaeologist named Flanders Petrie who was an excavator of Sarabit al Khadim, and actually his wife, the wife of Flanders Petrie, found these tiny little sphinxes. Now, on this tiny little sphinx, you can see right here, we might recognize that from early in the presentation, this is the symbol for Hathor. There's the falcon, and there is the square, the mansion, Chawet Her, remember? This is very, very easy um, Egyptian. But down here on the side, this is something very, very unusual. And it was Flanders Petrie who suggested, and he was right, that this is an early depiction or an early transcription of a Semitic language. In other words, this is taking Egyptian symbols and modifying them to represent Semitic sounds. And so this first one here, A, we see over here is Balat. Balat, or Baal, Baal. This is a god, Baal. And also Balat. Now Balat means mistress, and this was the canonic word for Hathor. And so this, you can see them down here, Balat and Baal. These are some of the earliest alphabetic writings. Actually, it's not an alphabet, it's more of what we would call an abjad, meaning that the letters represent consonantal sounds, not exactly vowels, so it's called an abjad. But still, this was a major first step in being able to write things down in an alphabetic language. So, these Canaanites, they didn't stay in Sarabit, they eventually, when they made their money, they went home, back to Phoenicia. And if you're interested in this topic, then I very highly recommend this article by um, Dr. Goldwasser. Uh, this is How the Alphabet Was Born from Hieroglyphs, and you can find it in Biblical Archaeology Review, um, 36.2, page 40 to 53. Please look that up if you're interested to understand a little more. I didn't absolutely did not do it justice in this presentation, but you can find out all the details there. Very much worth your time and energy to take a look at that. Now, the Phoenicians had this kind of script here. This is the Phoenician Abjad. We often call it the Phoenician alphabet. And if you take a look, it starts right here. This is Aleph. It's an ox. Beth is a house. Gimel is a camel. Uh, Dalet is a door. And so on. Now, you may be able to begin recognizing a kind of pattern here. A, B, G. Alpha, Beta, Gamma. The order of the alphabet is very, very old. We know that because we can find the examples of it in what we called Abecedarium, these little uh, blocks with alphabets written on them for students to study. And anyway, let's, get, let's not get off of topic. This is an example of the idealized Phoenician alphabet. And here is an actual Phoenician uh, inscription. This is called the Tabnit Sarcophagus. And it is the it is it was made for the Phoenician king Tabnit of Sidon. You can see at the top here we have Egyptian hieroglyphs, and at the bottom we have these are this is Phoenician. If we look carefully, right over there we can see Aleph. Now Aleph and Beth, the first two letters of the Phoenetic alphabet, they come directly from the goddess Hathor. Remember, this is one of the symbols of Hathor. And we can see, rising out of this basic shape, we have the Greek Alpha, the Latin A, and Bet, house, is the box within which that falcon is, and that's also her name. So 
A and B, the first letters of our alphabet, which by the way, alpha, beta, alphabet, this comes directly from the goddess Hathor. So the alphabet comes to Greece with the Phoenicians. They were doing business there. We'll talk about that in a minute. But we have this very beautiful sentence from Critias, and this is from uh, 460, this is when he lived, 460 to 443 BC. So this is a very old point. They understood where their language came from, and it says poinikes. You can see the first word, poinikes. This is Phoenicians. Deuron, gramat, alexiloga. This is Phoenicians discovered word-guarding scratches. So these scratches into um, pot shirts and, and into other areas, onto stone, these were word-guarding. They preserved words. It's a way of preserving a word to write it down. And the Greeks understood that it was the Phoenicians who discovered this. And so this is a set of the alphabet, the Phoenician, on both sides, different periods. And then right down the middle here, you can see from the 740 to 725, these are versions of the Greek alphabet. Now today, the version of the Greek alphabet that we recognize is kind of a synthesis of many different alphabets that were developing, and we don't want to get into that now, but you can look it up. You look up on um, Wikipedia is a good place, the Greek alphabet, and you can see something more of its history. But here's an example of um, a very famous text by Homer. This is hypothetical. And uh, if we take a look, it's written just as Phoenician was written in a Baustrophodonic style. So if we take a look here, we see that, that's the letter M. And if we look directly underneath it, this is another M, but you can see that it's backwards. Why is it backwards? It's backwards because you would read this way, and then when you get to the end, you would turn the corner and then read that way. Then you turn the corner again, you read this way. This is called baustrophodonic. It means as the ox turns. So if you imagine an ox um, plowing in a field, then you would turn in this way. And that was the way languages were written for a long time. Now, because the Greeks really invented an alphabet, in other words, they took the Phoenician symbols for all of the consonant sounds in their language, but then they ended up with a lot of leftover consonants because there were sounds in Phoenician that didn't exist in Greek. And what they did is they took those extra symbols and they used them to represent vowel sounds. And so because we have both consonants like M and vowels like E, or this would be mu and epsilon, we can still read this one. Now, this is a reconstruction. It's hypothetical. You can see at the bottom. Uh, but we can imagine that Homer's Iliad might have been written in something like this. In fact, uh, there is a wonderful theory, and I think it's a very strong theory, that as soon as the Greeks learned how to write down their language, they began copying down these epic poems that were oral compositions up until that time. And so we can still read this. If I take a close look, Menin aide thea, peleadio achileios, achileios, that is Achilles right there. Menin aide thea, peleadio achileios ulominein, he, he, muri achaios alge eteken, polas diftimos psukas aidi proiepsen hero on. And it goes on just like that. I think this is the first. Um, this is about the first 10, but probably the first 11 verses of Homer's Iliad, written as it may have been written in about the 7th century BC. So, if you're interested in this topic, then I very highly recommend this book for you. It's called Homer and the Origin of the Greek Alphabet by Barry Powell. Uh, you can still buy it online, and if you get a chance, uh, or check it out the library. This is a wonderful, wonderful book if you're interested in this fascinating period in history. Now, a version of the Euboean Greek alphabet made its way to Etruria via the Euboean colony of Cumae. So they moved from the Greek island of Euboea all the way over to Cumae. Now, when the Greeks set up their colony in Italy, they encountered 
an advanced civilization there in the Italian peninsula. Now, the first thing that comes to your mind would be, oh, they encountered the Romans. No, this is far too early in history for the Romans to be anything of any sort of significance. The civilization that they encountered was the Etruscan civilization. Now, the Etruscans learned these letters from the Greeks, and they did the same thing as the Greeks did. They took what they needed for what they... Um, they took what would express the sounds of their language, and then they retasked a few of them to express other things that the Greeks didn't have. And so you end up with this is Etruscan, the Etruscan alphabet. And down here is a more, um, let's say, standardized sort of version. So not all of the Greek alphabet made it into classical Etruscan. Some of it was just left to the side. So this is the Western Greek alphabet here. This is archaic Etruscan, and this is classical Etruscan. And so, once again, people use what is useful, and they discard what is not, or they repurpose what is not useful immediately to make it useful in another way. This is called creativity. Now, here's an example of an Etruscan text. This is on the upper lid of a small bottle. And because this is um, an alphabet along with um, vowels, we can read it. And so here, we, I've written it over here so we can see. You have mi, 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 sun te ruza, sun te ruza, spurias, spurias, mlakas. Now, it's very difficult to read Etruscan because we don't quite understand that language altogether. But we can understand, or we can guess through looking at Latin translations, we have me is I. Uh, spurias is the name of a woman, Spurias. And Malakas means beautiful. And we, we guess that this is um, the word Sunteruza is the is a word for this container. This is very common. Uh, today, if, if I wanted to mark something as mine, I would say Quentin made this, or I made this. But uh, usually in the ancients, with the ancients, in many different languages, what they would do is they would write on the, whatever it was that was created, and they would give that thing voice. So this is the container saying to whomever, takes the lid off, and there's this little note right around the rim. You see this would be covered, but when you lift it, you could see it. It says, I am the little container of the beautiful spuria. This is probably a makeup jar or a perfume jar, and so this is Etruscan. Now, the Latin comes from the Etruscan, so this is the Etruscan alphabet here, and then this is the Latin alphabet right here. So the Latin alphabet comes from the Etruscan, and this is the earliest bit of Latin here, and uh, it's actually very, very um, difficult to read Latin, and in fact, um, no one's really entirely sure what it means. There are lots of competing theories for what it means, but it's absolutely Latin, and you can see how these Etruscan letters become the Latin ones that are so familiar to us. A, B, C, D, E, F, um, there's no G, uh, Z is here at the front, um, H, I, there's no J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, uh, there's no U, there's no double U, and Y hadn't been introduced just yet. Y comes in later uh, for Greek, but we'll talk about that in a second. So the question is, what about G, W, J, and Y? And the answer is, uh, the letter G, we actually know exactly who invented the letter G. This man here, named Spurius Carvilius Ruga, who lived around 230 BC, was a freedman um, of another person named Spurius Carvilius Maximus Ruga, and he is often credited with inventing the Latin letter G. His invention would have been quickly adopted in the Roman Republic because of the letter C, because the letter C was, at the time, confusingly used for both the k sound and the g sound. Ruga was um, also the first man in recorded history to open a private elementary school, and this was the point. Uh, he is teaching 
letters to his students. And I'm sure, uh, as a teacher myself, he was constantly running into problems with students having this one letter that could be k or g. And so at a certain point he says, here is a letter for k. And if we make a little distinguishing mark on it, then that can be g. And so then we have the letter G. W comes much later in the development of um, Germanic languages. Uh, in Latin, if you have a V, and then you have it followed by, or this is really U, but we'll call it V, and it's followed by another vowel, any sort of vowel, then it becomes a kind of W sound in classical Latin. So this is W, W becomes a W sound here, W, like that. And so if they wanted this W, so they just basically pushed it together. That's why we call it double U, right? Double U, it means two U's joined together in this way. The letter J is the most junior member of the alphabet and has a very interesting origin. It started actually as a way of representing number. This is the Roman numeral 12. And if you had written this in some sort of ledger, you know, some sort of book to say how much money uh, someone owed you or how much you have to pay someone, a person could sneak in and get into your, your, your ledgers and just add a, a number, you know, and now you're paying them one dollar more than you should. And so what they did is if it was actually just 12, then they would write it like this, that tail was to show that that's the end. So if someone came along and added another number, you could see that they were forging the book. They're messing around with it. And so this letter J becomes a letter later on because we needed a letter for a J sound in English and a Y sound in other Germanic languages. And that's also, incidentally, why the letter I and the letter J have dots on them. That's because they are essentially the same letter, just two forms of the same letter. Y, well, Y was a Greek letter, and the Romans imported it to spell Greek words. So here we are, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, and Z, the most familiar alphabet to uh, English speakers. And also, this would be a little weird to um, Romans of the first or second century, but they would realize that this was something that belonged to them. Now, how does all this come together? We have this man here. His name is Jean-Francois Champollion. And he's famous because he deciphered the Rosetta Stone. And this is the Rosetta Stone right here. At the bottom, we had a Greek text. In the middle, you had a Demotic text, which was a type of Egyptian. And at the top, you had the hieroglyphs. The bottom text says that these three texts say the same thing. And so he very, very cleverly was able to work out or to decipher uh, the Egyptian language. Now, why is this all important? Well, it's interesting that he was in very serious competition with a lot of scholars of great achievement. He was able to break through because he essentially understood hieroglyphs in a deeper sense. He understood, he, number one, he approached it linguistically and not mathematically as Thomas Young in Britain did. He also began, uh, had an idea that the Egyptian hieroglyphs may not simply be symbols, as everyone up until his time thought of it. He said maybe they, have, they, have, they express an idea, some of them. Uh, some of them might express, um, it could be just a picture of something. And other symbols might actually also be sounds. So we could have within these sounds pictures, and also ideas. Now, this led him to be able to decipher the Egyptian alphabet, and I'm sorry, not the alphabet, the Egyptian hieroglyphs, um, before anyone else. And the question is, how was he able to do that? And the answer is startling, actually. Um, Champollion studied Chinese. In fact, this is one of the first books uh, this is the first uh, Chinese grammar book ever published in Europe. And you can see down here at the bottom, it is published in 1742. And you can see here that it was written by Stephanus Fumon. 
And I want to correct something. And, I, I, and if you doubt me, I want you to go out and research and find the truth of this because I'm going to tell you something right now. This guy is a was, he's dead now, obviously, he was a thieving bastard. Um, actually, this Chinese book was written by a Chinese man uh, who is known as Arcadius Huang, or Huang Jia uh, Lue. And he actually went to Europe, to France. He wrote this grammar in Latin, and then he died. It's very sad. He married a French woman. Uh, they had a baby. Uh, the baby died of cholera, and then his wife died shortly after, and he essentially starved himself to death and died. And um, the bastard Fourmont um, gathered up all of his work, uh, essentially discredited him, and then slapped his name onto the grammar. And for a very, very long time, Fourmont received um, the accolades that go along with such a magnificent work. And it wasn't until much later that um, the Jesuits, actually, um, exposed Fremont for the fraud that he was and very rightly honor Arcadius Huang for this great achievement. But the thing I want you to notice, though, it says lingue sinarum. I'm reading in church Latin. Lingue sinarum. These are the language of the... This is actually lingue sinarum. This is the Chinese language. This is the Mandarinique, Mandarinice, Mandarinique. This means Mandarin Chinese language. And this is, of course, the government leaders, the language of the government. And this is the main text here is Grammatica, Grammatica. So this is the grammar of the Chinese language, of the Mandarin Chinese languages. And notice that the characters involved are hiero glyphics or hieroglyphic hieroglyphs so certainly in the mind of champollion so certainly in the mind of champollion the chinese characters were hieroglyphs and he transports from the chinese characters a kind of understanding of how egyptian might work as it turned out i mean there's no relation between chinese characters and egyptian hieroglyphs but as it were turns out there, was, there were a lot of transferable ideas, and this gave Champollion the edge that he needed to decipher hieroglyphs. So this word, hieroglyphique, in reference to Chinese characters, is certainly what must have given um, Champollion the inspiration to, to achieve the great work that he did. And so, at the beginning, the question was, how do these things relate? We have Chinese characters. Chinese characters helped unlock the hieroglyphs through the work of Champollion. The hieroglyphs help explain the origin of the Latin alphabet, and the Latin alphabet forms the basis of Hanyu Pinyin, which helps people read Chinese characters. And so there is a link. Thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed this presentation. Have a good day.